Hello all, in this particular lecture on the series of GS section of Rajasthan, that is the general studies of Rajasthan, today's topic that I'm going to take is Prajamandal movement in Rajasthan. So uh, Rajasthan in general was a Rajputana state and uh, it was a princely state and there were other princely states in India as well. So today's lecture, I'm going to tell you what eventually led up to Prajamandal movements in various states of India. That is right now they recognize as states like Odisha, like Kathiawar, like Rajasthan. You would see why such movements eventually uh, led, led to. So basically there were a few things that eventually led to these such kind of movement. And this is what is my today's theme on. Overall, this particular lecture will set up the tone for the further lectures in which I'm going to discuss the various Prajamandal movements like Jaipur, Jaipur Raji Prajamandal, Mewar Raji Prajamandal, Hadauti Raji Prajamandal, Kota Raj Prajamandal, and so on and so forth. But today, in this lecture, let us first start with the very fundamental as to why such movements but with eventually made a place in the history. So without wasting a time, let us start. Okay. So Prajamandal movement in Rajasthan, uh, it eventually began in 1931 with the first Prajamandal movement in, ja in the Jaipur, in the Jaipur, that is, it is said as, it is, it is called Jaipur Raj Prajamandal movement. And this is the first movement that we are going to study later but today as i mentioned i'm going to start with only introductory lecture so what is the theme of the lecture the theme of the lecture is to introduce also motivate you to understand why such movements even existed and why such movements eventually took place what was the nature of such prajamandal movements specifically in rajasthan what are the contributions of such prajamandal movements in rajasthan Various Prajamandal movements and conclusions we shall take in the second lecture. But today I'm going to cover the first four, uh, you can say, pillars of this particular lecture series. So, uh, what was eventually, uh, what was eventually the reason for any such movement? Okay. So, as you're aware, that in India, after 1857, so I'm talking of beyond 1857, you are aware that 1857 was a Sepoy mutiny, okay? And you would find in that particular Sepoy mutiny, the princely states had a very different kind of rules. So much of the princely state did not actually support that cause, that is the revolt of 1857. And eventually, uh, this particular thing, uh, led to the autocracy of the princely states. So let me start. So what was happening? So initially, I can say that the patterns of the British conquest was itself a reason for the emergence of princely order. It is, it is to be noted that two-fifths of the Indian subcontinent, which had around one-third of the population of that particular time, that is of the British Empire, so basically that particular population, one third of the population and two fifths of the Indian subcontinent were ruled by the princes. And what has happened, for example, in the case of Rajasthan also, it was Lord Matt Kulf, which actually forced a treaty between British India and the Rajputana state as it around 1818. And eventually the Rajputana, most of the Rajputana felt into the paramountcy of the British realm, and even if it did not fail, the lately the theory, uh, lately the uh, lately the uh, policy of uh, subsidiary uh, subsidi subsidiary alliance by Wellesley, uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, there were different treaties which were made by Hastings. Also, there were different uh, ma mannerism, like for example, doctrine of lapse because of which the Udaipur state also fell. So eventually, you would find that uh, most of the states, by the time 1857, recognized the paramountcy of the British crown. 
and most of the rulers enjoyed full autocratic powers of their subject. In this, in this context, it is, it is to be understood that the British protected the autocracies of the princes from both external and internal dangers. And overall, I can say that the princely state were just useful tool in overall imperial design of the Britishers. In fact, they willingly supported their patrons in the time of crisis, either because of war or due to the inter intense nationalist mobilization. And you, you will see all these things and all these designs and all these kind of things um, done by the princes, ruling princes, in even in the revolt of 1857. That how did they actually sided with British side? Okay. Uh, specifically the Rajasthan state you would see. Okay. So uh, the first thing, uh, as I told you, that eventually that the, uh, the most important reason that the patterns of British conquest were it, it, itself responsible for the emergence of the princely order. Okay. Okay. There was uh, one thing that needs to be understood is that initially, that is before 1857 rebellion, most of the British bureaucrats uh, were not very fond of princes. Okay, They were not very fond of the princes. They were not very fond of the old Darbari system. Okay, In fact, to them, the, the princes, or you can say the old Darbari system, or you can say that uh, the princely states and the mannerism of administration and all those things were a barrier to the were barrier to the indigenous society and institutional change. So basically, uh, it, it they were nothing more than uh, corrupt or a sort of socioeconomic stagnation. Okay. So in uh, other words, uh, these were just kind of uh, oriental despots, which was standing in the way of modernization and social change. So initially, British were not very fond of. Fond of uh, these princes. Okay. However, during 1857 is selection, that is during 1857 revolt, especially rulers of Masur, Patiala, and Hyderabad bolstered their credential as trustworthy and loyal military, administrative, and political supporters of British power. So what happened in 1857, for example, in context of Rajasthan also, you can see that uh, the Sepoy mutiny at Dhalpur was eventually suppressed by the Maharaja of Patiala. So all these things actually led, led to uh, garnering the faith of Britishers. So the princes, or you can say that uh, princely states, eventually uh, uh, the British, uh, sorry, the British Empire uh, started to have faith in these princely states post-1857. And what did happen? The, the princes became the natural leaders of the Indian society since the view of the British officials changed. They were awarded with various ceremonial awards, and in certain circumstances, they were also given some extra territories. In fact, Queen Victoria proclaimed that all territories and engagements made with them or under the authority of the Honorable East India Company are now accepted by us and will be scrupulously observed. And further, that we desire no extension of our present territorial possessions and we shall respect the rights, dignity and honor of the native princes as our own. So basically, here there was again a kind of divide and rule you can say. Queen Victoria basically started to say that we will respect the rights of the native princes. Why did they do so? Because they know that uh, these princes were good for nothing and basically uh, British would exercise their power through these princes. These princely state were of different different sizes. Uh, in fact, if, if you take Rajasthan for that matter, today's Rajasthan for that matter, and if you consider those princely states, their areas were too large. Even much of the European nations can come on, on those particular uh, states. So these princely states were just vast assortments of states, different sizes, composition, different resources. But the problem with these states were that the sovereignty of princes was not autonomous. In fact, they were under constant imperial surveillance, constant, uh, there was interference from the British Empire or the paramount power, and princes no longer enjoyed their old Darbari kind of system, okay? And they could not function without the mediation of the paramount power. In fact, uh, 
most of these princes, especially when it comes to Rajputana, that is Rajasthan, by the time of 1818, much of the Rajputana uh, made treaties with the Britishers through Lord Madcalf, as I told you initially also, then through uh, Warren, uh, like Warren Hastings, and through the uh, Treaty of the Subsidiary Alliance by Wellesley. And these, basically what was happening, these autocracy of princes were just an indirect despotism, despotism of British official. That is, they were actually ruling. So basically, uh, the autocracy of, uh, autocracy of princes were directly being or cruelly ruled by British officials who were controlling the state apparatus through different in ingenious devices and mechanisms. And these princes had autocratic rule and most of the powers were into the hands of their favorites. Uh, you can say that uh, most of the power were into the hands of the feud, feudal lords, uh, which we'll say uh, in the, the general term, Jagi Tars. Okay. So these patrimonial, matrimonial administration were run by rulers or their relatives. And basically through them, princely, princes were exercising their power. And through princes, Britishers were exercising their power. What was happening? Land revenue, the burden of land revenue was very high. Why it was very high? Because of the administrative machinery. And uh, because Britishers were actually uh, taking care of these princely states, so there was a different kind of taxation system. And because of which eventually the land revenue burden was increasing. And what was happening? That rulers were enjoying the supreme control over the state revenues for their personal use. And in fact, this even led to very ostentatious kind of living. And what was happening? The princely, inside the princely state, there, were, there was a great amount of disharmony among the people. They could see that their princes are good for nothing and they're basically just the stooges of British Empire, but they were left only with the state of frustration. And they could see, and you can see with the state, with the emergence of newspapers and with the emergence of uh, communication, they were able to understand that there is a there is an air of internationalism that was prevailing outside. But the prince within princely state, the people were getting frustrated because of these prince uh, because of these uh, rule of uh, such princes who were eventually these kings. You can say who were actually nothing but but puppets in the hand of the British Empire. Further, the rulers shared powers with the Jagirdars, as I told you in the initial slide. And these Jagirdars were actually controlling the landed resources. And these Jagirdars were nothing but the supporters or relatives of the rulers. In fact, these feudal elements, that is these Jagirdars, also enjoyed very varying degree of authority. That is true. And which eventually again led to many peasant moments, the peasant movements. And this will see in different uh, lecture series. And uh, peasants had basically no voice in the administration. And there were very, very harsh tax uh, rates. There were very harsh kind of uh, things like Begar system, uh, which were actually prevailing. About Jagirdars, it, it is to be noted that it was they were not only collecting and retaining the land revenues, but also limited. They had also some limited police and magistral powers. So basically, they had some kind of judicial powers as well. In Alwar state, for instance, Jagirdars who had kingship relationship with the ruler controlled about one third of the fertile lands in the southern part of the state. And Jagirdars not only were actually taking the revenues, but also held administrative position. So this was a this was a state. This was how uh, what what kind of pathetic kind of state? Because see, one third of the fertile lands of the southern parts of state were controlled by the Jagirdars, who were who were nothing but the relatives of the uh, king himself. Also. Now there was a kind of uh, conflict which eventually was perpetrated through Britishers. And uh, what was happening, like for example, during Raja Bani's rule in 1815 to 1857 in Alwar, outside Muslim officials that were trained in British method of administration were started to were appointed, and which eventually led to the conflict between Zagir Daz and new class of administrators. Okay, so all these kind of things. So you can see that. Uh, 
as we are approaching to, towards the 19th century, you can see that there are a whole lot of different things happening in these princely state. However, some of the princes were intelligent enough to recognize the resentment among the people and they introduced representative assemblies in their states. Although they were not that democratic, but still some some of the uh, some of the states did recognize the fact that the people were resenting and they they started introducing some kind of representative assemblies in their state and which was the first state to introduce so masur was probably the first state to inaugurate a representative assembly as in as long, like as back as 1881 okay now again it is to be noted that the political mobilization the princely state passed through three distinct phases. In the first phases, the mobilization was just created on some specific local grievances, such as employment of too many foreigners in the administrative services, lack of freedom of press and assembly, and all these small, small kind of grievances were just um, just uh, being told to the to the you can say the rulers in a very parliamentary kind of way in the in the means of petitions prayers and this were these all kind of prayers and petitions about some specific local grievances were made through urban literate groups and what did it eventually led to it eventually led to something called as praja mandal movement so do, as you can say that as, as things were increasing urban literate groups were actually putting these demands putting these kind of grievances to their uh, lords or to their rulers about some small, small kind of issues. It started with some kind, some small kind of local grievances. Like for example, as I mentioned that there was too much outer in influence or outer kind of interference in the administrative system. There was a lack of freedom of press, assembly, and all these things started uh, um, starting to accumulate. And the urban literate groups started to keep these demands in the form of prayers and petitions in the parliamentary way. And in 1910s, you can see that various states in India, there were urban educated people who started to form something called as Prajamandal or Loka Parishads. Initially, you could see that the demands from the agitators were the guaranteeing of the civil liberties like freedom of press, assembly, association, and in some instances, to have some sort of representative assembly in these princely states. However, initially, they did not question the legitimacy, legitimacy of the princely order, okay? And they did not actually demand an outright abolition of the princely state, okay? So initially, they knew uh, that uh, they could be oppressed too harsh to make such kind of thing. So basically, they just went to the princes or just went through this kind of channel um, just, to keep their, uh, just to keep their grievances. But they did not want it to usurp the, uh, the entire uh, princely setup. And basically what happened was, because they knew that if they're going to put their demands directly to the people, then things will not uh, work the way they want. So what happened? These Prajamanda leaders usually attributed political oppression in the state not directly to the princes, but but to the authoritarian or corrupt of officials, frequently outsiders, or sometimes the scheming Zenana women or their advisor. So basically, what did they do? They knew that they do knew that uh, if they were they're going to directly charge on princes, then things may not turn up well. So basically, they attributed their political uh, oppression to authoritarian and corrupt officials, to the outsiders even to the Janana women who are scheming some kind of plotting, some kind of things, and even to their advisors. This is again asserting that they, did, they were not challenging the authority of the princely order, okay? They, would, they knew uh, that if they're going to go direct and say that princes are uh, responsible or the kings are responsible, then things would not uh, turn up well. So basically, 
this uh, they, they were keeping they were registering their kind of complaints and they were telling that all this kind of political operation that the people in the princely states are undergoing it is because of these corrupt officials because of the outsiders because of scheming and women or their advisors and as i told you praja mitra mandali was formed in 1917 in masur and not only this this kind of movement was taking place all along the country in the states like baroda bhur indore Kathiawadi Rajki Parishad was formed in 1921. In the similar year, you can find the Deccan State Subjects Conference was also being formed. Now, as you are aware, I told you in the very first stage, the manner of keeping these demands or deliberations were just petitions and prayers. Now, what is happening? And you should understand these are the times like 1920s, 1930s. India is under a mass movement that is a non-cooperation movement. So. there was a intense mass mobilization all through the country and by the growth of media and various newspapers uh, even the people in the state in the princely states were feeling some kind of agitation they were understanding that they were understanding the air of nationalism okay and the second stage stage emerged in late 1920s and the first half of 1930s and the petitioning now has become direct confrontation and public protest in form of the street demonstration and who were basically responsible for that literate urban class of the people were responsible and such organizations emerged which were actually taking these kind of public protest confrontations and registering their uh, registering their resentment and these kind of organization emerged eventually in bhavnagar gondal junagadh and most of the rajputana states in 1920s in rajasthan it started in early 1930s you start we'll see in this uh, in the next lecture see next lecture i'm going to tell you that uh, what were the various prajamandal movements in rajasthan right now i'm just trying to make up a build up a kind of story that was if, that was responsible for the prajamandal movements and uh, you should also understand this this is the time like 1920s to 1930s is a time where you can see that india is undergoing non cooperation movement under the leadership of gandhi okay and uh, as i mentioned that uh, kathiawadi rajki parishad was formed in 1921 deccan state subject conference was also formed in punjab you can see the punjab riyasati praja mandal was formed by the second half of 1920s an active phase of agitation began in many states in rajasthan specifically jamna lal bajaj he was called as the fifth son of the gandhi he actually organized in 1920 something called as rajputana madhya bharat sabha which was attended by arjun lal sethi kesri lal barhad rao gopal singh and vijay singh patel these are all very legendary figures in rajasthan history and arjun lal sethi which eventually be very instrumental in forming jaipur rajya praja mandal in 1931 this we are going to see but understand rajputana madhya bharat sab sabha was organized in 1920 under the chairmanship of jamnal bajaj i am re reasserting that he was also called as the fifth son of the gandhi In 1921, uh, the second political conference was organized, which was attended by Motilal Nehru, the father of Jawaharlal Nehru, in which the foreign clothes was burned, and basically this was the modulus operandi of uh, non-cooperation movement. In 1928, Rajputana Native States Public Council was established, which led the foundation of Praja Mandal movement in Rajasthan. The educated groups were now demanding more representation. They were demanding. A responsible government, and now they are directly saying that okay, we are not denying princely authority, but we want a responsible government with which would diminish princely autocracy, and they know that basically this is princely autocracy is 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 a manner. This is a tool in which British British uh, are actually exercising their uh, power over the. subjects of the princely states so again they are not actually directly challenging the princely authority but they are saying that we want a responsible government which would eventually which would which which would actually diminish the princely autocracy they are again saying that we are not denying the princely authority but we want somehow a responsible government to be formed and this is 
like we want our voices to be heard now in third phase now this is a very uh, uh, critical phase in 1930s to 1940s there are whole uh, different kind of movements that were taking around uh, especially in rajputana that is rajasthan you would see um, like for example uh, the peasants movement so for example there's a peasant movement in, uh, which took place in bijolia uh, which was in you can say mewar uh, region and all these peasant mobilize mobilization uh, were happening okay and the urban educated middle class was also getting mobilized but there was no such direct link between the peasants protest and the urban politics there were all kind of um, movements like uh, bijolia movement and these peasant movements and there were tribal movements in the motilal tejawat which were happening there were happening some tribal reforms under bhagat singh uh, all these things were happening but uh, the, the link was missing but all these things paved a way of revolution and which actually was a very prominent kind of feature in 1930s and 1940s as a whole and uh, this all led to the pinnacle of uh, this all led to the you can say the upsurge of the movement um, in this this particular decade that is 1930s to 1940s however i am stating again that there was no such direct connect between the urban politics and uh, peasant movements uh, organizationally but understand uh, the mobilization was happening at the very ground level and when it is happening at the ground level uh, it is like the voices are now being uh, now getting uh, all the more intense and the jhat kisan mahasabhas in 1930s were not only were not only uh, actually challenging the princely states or you can say princely autocracy but now they are challenging the ritual status now they are challenging even the rajput's prerogatives of riding elephants horses and camels and everything so now you can see that resentment is growing now resentment is growing in the rajputana states what are the some what are some very important milestones so what happens is as non cooperation movement was happening in 1920s and subsequently you can see in different other states as i mentioned in mysore you can see that uh, lok parishad was already formed so in different state a uh, praja mandal was starting to appear one important congress session that you need to remember is a nagpur congress session congress has passed had passed a resolution nagpur congress session in 1920 asking the princes to grant democratic government to their subjects the congress also allowed persons from states to join the congress organization as its primary members but congress also made it conditional with the rider that congress members in the state could not take part in any political activity in the states as congressmen or in the name of congress but only in their private capacity as individuals or as members of a local political organization that is what congress was doing basically it was not trying to challenge again the princely uh, autocracy here directly because it never wanted to fight uh, it never wanted to find the war at two ends basically it was already finding a, 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 a fighting a war at uh, with the british empire directly so it, it never wanted to mingle with all kind of mess so what it told in nagpur congress session it told to the princes that you grant democratic government to your subjects and it also motivated people from the princely states to join the congress organization as it as, as its primary member but it made it a condition uh, with a condition and what what was the rider it made a rider that whosoever takes part in any political activity in the state shall not tell himself as a congressman or shall not conduct any sort of activity in the name of congress and uh, only thing they can do they can uh, participate in any sort of uh, agitation only in the private capacity or should develop their own organization okay or should develop their own organization 
You should understand this Nagpur Congress session of 1920 is extremely important in the history of India. It was this session in which the main resolution on non-cooperation movement was passed and the precedent to this particular 1920 session was C. Viragava Chare. Now further as I go, the democratic aspirations of the people in the princely state started to take a concrete kind of shape and this kind of concrete organizational form in 1927 was, was actually, uh, which uh, a concrete uh, organizational form took place in 1927 in the name of All India States People's Conference. And initiative of people like Balwant Rai Mehta, which we will see in Mewad, Raji Prajamandal, Manik Lal Kothari, and Jiyar Abhyankar. So all these people very, very, were very instrumental in uh, making All India States People's Conference. Now, you would see in history of India, 1929 session is very important. The Lahore session is extremely important uh, session where the resolution to Poon Sarajji was made. And in this particular session, you can see in the Congress itself, there was a growing young, young brigade, uh, which actually was a left-leaning brigade. So the two very important faces of the left-leaning brigade in the Congress party itself were Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhash Chandra And in 1929, that is the Lahore session of the Congress, it was stated that the fate of the states was linked with the rest of India. So basically now the Congress party uh, is recognizing the princely states and that only the people of the states would have right to determine the political future of the states. So basically now they are denying, denying the prince, princes, or you can say denying the uh, princely autocracy. Now they are saying that the fate of the states are linked with the rest of India and only people of India, people of those states can determine the political future of that state. Further, what happened? There was a divisive kind of policy that was formed. However, it was not executed, but it was it was formulated through Government of India Act 1935. And what was the plan? So it conceived of a plan of a federation in which Indian princely states to, were to, uh, Indian states were to be brought into direct constitutional relationship with British India, and the princely states were to send representative to the federal legislature. Why the scheme was uh, being looked not very uh, not very fruitful because see in this particular scheme, uh, the representatives were to be sent. Okay. And these representatives, when they were to be sent, they were to be only nominated. So basically, the representatives from the princely state, which were going, which were, uh, which were actually being sent, or which were to be sent to the federal legislature, all these uh, representatives were just nominated by rulers and not democratically elected. And why this was the case? Because uh, Britishers knew that this was in, this would ensure that the national representative would always remain in minority now princes would would eventually nominate someone um, someone very uh, close to them and uh, and since uh, basically these uh, princely states were nothing but the design of the british empire so they knew that uh, somehow in the federal legislature the national representatives would be less although this part of the act was never implemented and both Congress and the All India States People Conference that we studied in the previous slide opposed the move and demanded that all the representatives for the federal legislature should be based, should be on the basis of a popular elected principle. Also, assumption of offices by Congress. So basically what happened after 1935, Congress participated in election and assumption of offices by the Congress in majority of the provinces of the British India in 1937 also had an electrifying impact on the popular participation and then the political process both in British India, both in British India territories and the princely states. So what was happening? Uh, so what was happening that in 1937, you would see the Congress uh, participated in elections and in majority of the provinces, uh, people could understand what democracy is, what elections are. So basically they would understand uh, what it means to be participating in a democratic process. 
further the left oriented congress i told you that the congress was now in the in the young blood and the young hands of uh, nehru and subhash chandra bose and the left oriented congress was now very much influenced by nehru and subhash chandra bose especially after 1930s and they were demanding more radical policy in the princely states and here comes the most important session which is the haripura session and it eventually also marks a great sort of a very starking difference between subhash chandra bose and gandhi and beyond that in 1939 we will see that basically gandhi was actually not very pleased with the with the with the presidentship of subhash chandra bose but this particular session is very 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 crucial for understanding the understanding the rights given to the princely state so the most monumental recognition to the praja mandal movement or the rights of the people in the princely state were observed in indian national congress haripura session that it was a 51st session and was held in the haripura village in the surat district gujarat in 1938 it was presided over by subhash chandra bose and in this session there was an intense debate on the issue of the princely state and finally congress announced that its aim to attain complete independence for the whole of india now includes the princely states and this start this eventually led to the demand of responsible government and guaranteeing of the civil liberties in the state taking the consideration of the recent growth of the peace and movements the congress party also reiterated its recognition of the right of kisan sabhas to organize themselves in the unions so this was very monumental step so you have to remember a few of the a uh, milestone congress session that is a nagpur congress session it was it was headed by c raghuachar c v raghuacharya it was the first session where princes were asked to uh, to have a democratic government for their subjects however in this particular session congress was not making it a mandatory kind of thing so for example if a person is joining congress party Uh, it was keeping a rider that in state if you are taking part in any political activity you should not take it in the name of congress and it was it was actually promoting that you become some member of the local political associations basically congress did not wanted to mingle in the internal affairs of the princely state in 1920s but in 1927 you know that all india states people's conference was convened by the efforts of balwant ram mehta manikal kuthari and jr abhyankar these are from all different states balwant ram mehta is one of the very important figures in rajasthan history um he was also the member of the constituent assembly uh in 1929 that is in the lahore session when the when it was observed that the pun saraj should be uh, pun saraj resolution resolution to the pun saraj was taken up uh, so it was recognized that the fate of states should be linked to the rest of india and only the people of the state should have the right to determine also the divisive act of government of india act 1935 in which indian states were brought into the direct constitution constitutional relationship to british india and now states were to send representative to the to representatives to the federal legislature but the scheme was democratic in the sense that whosoever has to be sent to the federal legislature from the states has to be nominated by their rulers and cannot be democratically elected which was actually not in the very uh, not very uh, not very uh, not very you can say in line with the uh, democratization and why it was uh, why this kind of step was uh, being taken uh, in by british british uh, uh, britishers um, through government of india act 1935 because they wanted that not much national representatives get into the federal legislature so they wanted to always keep these national representatives in minority but as you know as i told you that this particular act was not implemented but people were starting to recognize the designs of the british diplomacy also as i told in this particular era of 1930s and 40s there was a left leaning in the congress and this particular left wing was uh, being uh, the, the left wing crusaders were basically subhash chandra bose and uh, subhash chandra bose and jawaharlal nehru and this particular young blood further also because of the uh, winning of the congress in provinces in 1937 uh, had an electrifying impact on the popular participation in the political process 
So all these things and the most monumental thing that I already told you was the Haripura Congress session where it was it was first time announced that complete independence for whole of India also included the princely state and it also demanded for the very first time the responsible government. In context to Rajasthan, on 24th April 1938, Manikilal Verma established Mewar Rajya Prajamandal, which gave a new momentum to the freedom movement. And uh, the local community folk singers expressed this uh, Prajamandal's objectives through their folk songs. And these songs awakened people from both political and social perspectives. They highlighted that the Prajamandal's uh, Prajamandal movement's objectives were to attain rights, but to get civil liberties and freedom from the atrocities being committed by the by the feudal lords, by the princely states, princely uh, autocrat, uh, princely autocracy. One of those such songs is called as Sanya Ranaji, which addresses Ranaji and reveals that under the Englishman rule, dogs are enjoying more delicacies than humans. The song emphasizes the need of the Prajamandal to unite and liberate. And this particular song, which is the Syana Ranaji, sorry, uh, is considered the people's anthem. And one of the very good poet called as Ghansham Rao composed a song called as Sal Van Gavad in Mewadi, which elucidates the objectives of the Prajamandal. The song emphasizes unity in protesting against atrocity so that farmers can be liberated from the oppression. So this particular song, you should remember, it is, it is called as Chal Vaganavat. It was written by Ghansham Rao. And it was elucidating the objectives of the Prajamandal movement. It was also emphasizing that uh, there should be unity in protesting against the atrocity so that the farmers can be liberated from the oppression. And now, you can see after 1938, as I mentioned, one of the instances that I gave from Rajasthan, I, I should see that Prajamandal movement started to get uh, what, what was rooming in almost all parts of the states, all part of India. Um, in Odisha, there was a Garjat state, Garjat, and um, in, in Himachal Pradesh and at many places. In 1939, Tripuri session, Congress now passed a new resolution. It removed the earlier restraint on the Congress activities in the state. So, as I mentioned earlier, what was the restraint? The restraint in 1920 was placed that Congress allowed peoples from the state to join the Congress organization as a primary member, but could not take part in any political activity in the state under the banner of Congress. But now, in 1941, in the Tripuri session, there was a resolution which which removed this restraint on the Congress activity in the states, which actually meant a greater identification between the Congress and Prajamandals. In 1939, Jawaharlal Nehru was elected as a president of All India State People's Conference, a step that marked the merger of two streams of the democratic movement, that is the princely states and the British Indian. As a result of this, like previous movements, however, because of the communication and everything, people knew in princely states that non-cooperation movement is going all through the country, civil disobedience movement is going all through the countries, all sort of revolutionary activities under Chandrasekhar Azad or even said Bhavakat Singh or under Sanyal or uh, by uh, Savarkar, they could understand that these things were going on, but they could not directly participate. But now, with this kind of uh, Tripuri session resolution in 1939, uh, the princely states, uh, now people in the princely states could directly participate, even under the banner of Congress. And uh, what, uh, what was good about it? Like uh, now in 1942, as you know, that Quit India movement was, uh, uh, Quit India movement was, uh, was to was to you will see that in 1942 uh, quit india movement was going to take place um, so basically such kind of movement now everybody could be could could join such movement because of uh, this kind of resolution so in 1939 uh, 
Jawaharlal Nehru was elected as All India States uh, People Conference also in 1939. That is Tripuri session. Uh, you should remember this Tripuri session is very, very important for, um, um, for in Indian history. Why? Because again, it marks uh, it marks uh, the 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 very you can say uncompromising kind of um, uncompromising kind of uh, uh, distinction or you can say difference between the uh, Gandhi and uh, Subhash Bose. Basically, Gandhi wanted his uh, representative Pathabi Sitaramaiya uh, to actually take over this particular session. And Subhash Chandra Bose goes and wins this. And he never wanted Subhash Chandra Bose to win this particular session. And uh, contrary to his uh, thing, Subhash Chandra Bose goes and wins this particular election. Uh, but uh, actually, he was very opposed to the candidature of Subhash Chandra Bose. And um, um, basically, Gandhi was not very pleased in this particular session. So you should remember 1939 session is an important session. Both And here you can see that there was a resolution which was passed in which um, now like earlier restraint that was put on the people um, was not put, it was actually removed. And also in 1939, Zawadha letter was made for All India's People's Conference, uh, All India State's People's Conference. Okay, uh, there's a simple question that uh, you, it, it might come in your head that why did not Indian National Congress participate early and why it was just waiting for so long. So the strategy of non-interference, you can see of Congress was even there, even there during non-cooperation movement, even in the most prolific Gandhian phase that is during all these kind of moments that was taking place like Champaran and uh, even the movements like you can say uh, non-cooperation movement or civil disobedience movement, a general strategy of non-interference was assumed by Indian National Congress. Why? Because see, uh, there was lack of constraint, lack of you can say resources at the disposal of Congress. Also, that nationalist leadership did not wanted to participate at two ends. That is, it did not participate wanted to participate in a war with two people, and it also knew that uh, that princes were only nothing but the. Uh, but actually stooges of Britishers. So basically they knew that princes only existed due to the protection of the paramount power of the British. So they never wanted to fight simultaneously at two fronts. Also you would understand that the nature of these uh, uh, movements that was taking part were actually based on classes, like um, you can say that the peasant movement like Vijolia uh, um, movement and all such movements were based on class uh, at, at some places on religious lines uh, or probably you can say some uh, sort of cultural kind of lines for example uh, like jat kisan mahasabhas were formed uh, which were actually challenging the uh, autocracy of the rajputanas and all sort of, such things actually made congress to back uh, congress to step back and uh, because these were such very uh, regional kind of sentiments which were uh, which were the you can say uh, the main origin for uh, one of the main origin for these uh, kind of movements. So basically, it, Congress Party initially did not um, participate in any sort of democrat uh, in any sort of uh, movement which actually supported the civil liberties to the people in the princely state or um, for fight for the democracy for the princely state. In perspective to Rajasthan also. The nature of the Prajamandal movement was basically to fight against the feudalism and colonialism. And uh, the, uh, the people of Prajamandal wanted to fight against the feudal lords and the British administration simultaneously. And the main demand was obviously the democratic rights. But the, the, the methodology was very simple. They wanted to bring some social reforms among the people uh, and that as a manner of uniting people. They established schools, they used khadi, they encouraged the cottage industry and they started agitation against some very social evils like untouchability. What was the contribution of the Prajamandal movement? So contribution of Prajamandal, as you can see, uh, like... Uh, because of the political awakening in the state, because of the unity of the people, and because people were fighting for the rights, people were fighting for the rights against the princely, princely against the princely state administration, against the British government. So basically, it led to the improvement in education because, as I told, the nature was to establish schools, khadis, different organizations which would encourage cottage industries and uh, some agitation against untouchability. 
Also, you should understand after 1931, Gandhiji in 1939 um, started to work for the upliftment of horizons. Okay. So, all these Prajamandal movements also took part in the same backdrop. Okay. Around 1930s to 1940s or 1940, late 1945s, also you will find some Prajamandal movement um, sparking in Rajasthan. So, basically, it is such moment, it, it, it is such an era where civil disobedience has already gone. Civil disobedience movement took place around 1930s. Then you can know that there were uh, round table conferences, then there was Ambedkar Puna, uh, Ambedkar uh, Gandhi Pact, and you know that after that, Gandhi was actually working in the uh, working for uh, social cause like untouchability and uh, were be working vehemently and uh, he also actually authored a newspaper called as Harijan. So basically this was the time. So you can understand that uh, the Prajamandal movement in Rajasthan was also getting influenced by all such uh, political activities in the center and all these kind of uh, the nature of such revolts, the uh, nature of such mo movement was not only to oppose the uh, oppose the oppression by the princely state but also to bring social reforms and which eventually led to the improvement in education rise of social equality and uh, most importantly uh, it, it it actually contributed in breaking the insularity of the present moments by linking them with one another in different princely state and eventually also linking them with the present moments in british india so basically uh, this was a kind of uh, uh, actually amalgamate amalgamating different uh prison moments okay uh so this was all i wanted to tell you in the next lecture we are going to see the jaipur prajamandal the haroti prajamandal and uh, different other prajamandal like mewar prajamandal marwar prajamandal bharatpur uh, haroti prajamandal and all sort of different prajamandal movements that took place locally in rajasthan so for today, I am taking a goodbye. I hope you have liked my lecture. Uh, this particular lecture was an introductory lecture. So the people who are studying directly for Rajasthan state uh, even can think to skip this lecture. But a few prob for a few facts you may keep in mind. Specifically, I'm again telling one of the facts that you should keep in mind is which is the which was the main uh, one thing that you can keep in mind was the establishment of Rajputana Madhya Bharat Sabha in 1920 by Jamnalal Bajaj. You can also keep, keep in mind that there were some Jat Kisan Mahasabhas, which I'm going to talk in, in later section also. Uh, you, you should also keep in mind the Bijolia Andolan around the 1920s in Mewar. And this again we will touch in present moments. You should also keep in mind some very important Congress sessions like Nagpur Congress session where the where the democratic rights of the people were recognized by congress you should also keep in mind in 1927 all india states people conference was formed you should also keep in mind that in 1938 haripura congress session it was announced that the complete independence of the country of india also means also includes sorry the princely states and it was the first time when the uh, demand of responsible government was raised. Also, uh, just for the fact, in, on 24th April 1938, Mewar Rajya Prajamandal was formed by Mani Kelal Burma. And one of the very important songs was written by Ghansham Rao. The song was called as Chal Vaganavat. Syana Ranaji was one other song, which was actually to tell him uh, tell the Ranaji that is the king that uh, under Englishman rule, even the dogs are enjoying delicacies while humans are getting nothing. In Tripuri conference, it was the earlier restraint on the Congress activities was removed, and because of which now uniformity in the uh, in the national freedom struggle could be felt even in the princely state. So all of these things are quite important as a fact. In the next lecture, as I told you, I will be teaching you uh, the Prajamandal movements specifically in context to the Rajasthan. I hope to see you in the next lecture and we'll conclude with all the different Prajamandals, 
all the different personalities which were responsible for for uh, or you can say were instrumental in making such prasamandal uh, a success and i hope these lectures will give you a good amount of insight and i will not go in very detail but i will actually go through each and every every prasamandal movement and would 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 give you an idea of all these things so i think it would be very much enough for your for your gs kind of thing specifically for any rpsc examination thank you so much for listening to me with all patience